All right, got the recording started right at 10 a.m., even though it feels like 11 a.m. because of daylight savings time. Uh, audio and video is up. We're live. Welcome to Structures. Uh, we're in Lecture 30. Um, just a quick, a quick uh, overview of today and some uh, housekeeping. Um, I had that we were going to cover maximum response uh, on Wednesday, but I, I went through the notes. I think we're going to do that today. And so what I want to cover on Wednesday are some ASHTO applications. So, you know, if you remember, you know, one of the initial uh, reasons that we introduced the concept of influence lines is for bridges. So I'd like to talk about some of the ASHTO uh, load models that we use for highway bridges and just some things that you might see uh, in bridge engineering land. Uh, I'm a bridge engineer, so I can't help it. Uh, but I also think it would be highly beneficial so that when you start looking at some some of these calculations, there are some unique things in uh, bridge calculations that you might not see in uh, building design and whatnot. And so I think that's kind of valuable. But today what I want to do is I want to start using these influence lines that we've been drawing for the past week. I mean, up until now, you know, if I, um, uh, you know, if we go back and we recall the, the Mueller-Breslau principle, you know, the idea behind taking a structure, identifying uh, a, a response, remove from the structure the ability to resist that response, and then move the structure through a unit displacement. That's how we draw the influence line, right? And then we have these rules that go along with that and some concepts that, that, um, that we developed to draw influence lines for reactions. And then we said, okay, we can take those, uh, those uh, uh, that Mueller-Breslau principle uh, and come up with these rules. We can also take the Mueller-Breslau principle and come up with rules for internal shears and moments. And that's fine. And, and that's, that's necessary, but we haven't used them, right? We haven't, we haven't actually taken the influence lines and done anything with them. We just say, Here's an influence line. That's great. But what value uh, uh, is it? I mean, if I can draw this nice little uh, picture here with the, the triangles, you know, I've got this little picture here, and there's a, a, a negative region, a region and a positive region and whatnot. That's great. But if it doesn't have any use, then there's no real point. So what's the point? Why, why develop an influence line? Why draw an influence line? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so... I want to get right into it, and I want to talk about the two primary applications of an influence line, okay? Uh, and I want to spend an actual fair amount of time on the first, which is uh, to perform structural analysis. Uh, and, and sometimes a lot of textbooks and whatnot kind of gloss over this. I mean, they don't really gloss over it, but they kind of cover this at the same time they're covering the second application. And I think what would be valuable is to just take a second and let's do this, okay? So we're talking about um, what is the use of, of an influence line. The first use of an influence line is to just do the structural analysis. In other words, uh, an influence line can be a replacement for using equations of equilibrium. So for example, okay, let's take the structure here on the top, okay? So if I look at this structure, I have a simply supported beam and I'm moving a single unit load across the structure, okay? So let's let's come up with a real simple example. And we talked about this at the very beginning when we first started uh, introducing the concept of influence lines. We said, okay, if I have a beam and I put 80 pounds right in the middle of that beam, then each reaction is 40 pounds. And you get that 40 pounds by taking the 80 pound load and multiplying it by a half. And then you say, well, it actually doesn't really matter what the load is. If you have a load at mid-span, the reaction is half that load every time. And, uh, and that led to the development of an influence line. But but the, the real value of an influence line, and, and I'm just gonna use influence lines for reactions, but it really doesn't matter. It's, it's really any influence line. But let's take this beam. If I have an influence line drawn for say the reaction at B, then I know the reaction at B due to any load anywhere. And all you have to do is take the load and multiply it by the associated value on the influence line. And so if you're dealing with point loads, you just take the point loads and you multiply it by the associated value on the influence line. And if you've got distributed loads, what you do is you take the distributed load and multiply it by the area under the influence line. And um, that is pretty much it. And in order to illustrate that, I actually have an example focused on just this, okay? So we're gonna use influence lines to determine the following for the beam shown. We're gonna determine 
the influence line, or the, the, we're going to determine the support reaction at D, we're going to determine the internal shear at B, and we're going to determine the internal moment at B. And we're going to do that directly using the theory of influence lines. Okay. Now, um, you'll see the, the value of an influence line as we get into this. But what I want to do is I kind of want to go back to square one, and I want to show you how we would do this through equations of equilibrium, and then I'll show you how to do it with influence lines. Okay, so first off, let's let's stop the share and let's bring up the notebook. Let's, let's do that. So, uh, translation. Okay, so I have this uh, this structure here, and so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine the um, the uh, internal uh, you know shear moment. We're going to determine the reaction here. Let Let's start off with the reaction. So um, first thing I'm going to do is method number one, and we're going to use equations of equilibrium. And to, to illustrate the point, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the, um, uh, I'm just going to do the reactions first. So uh, let's start off, let me move this down here. Let's start off with the reaction at D, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. Now, this is bringing it back to square one, okay? So I'm going to take this, I'm going to idealize it as a single point load. And so that's uh, what do we have. We have 1.3 kips per foot times a distance of 20 uh, of 20 feet. So 1.3 times 20 is 26 kips. And then this distance here, uh, that distance is going to be uh, 10 feet, right? So that looks that is that is does not look like 10. That looks like 16 or something. 10 feet. Okay. So what I can then do is I look at the beam and I say, okay, I have a vertical reaction here, we'll call this dy, and I have a vertical reaction here, we'll call this a y, all right? So what we'll then do is we'll say, okay, let's sum moments at a, sorry, at a, let's sum moments at a to determine the reaction. And I'm, I'm walking you through this process because I want you to respect what we do here in a bit and how you get the, the same answer. So, so just bear with me. Okay, so we're gonna sum moments at A. So I have 26 kips times 10 feet. I've got 25 kips times, what is that? I think that's 40 feet. And then I've got 42 kips times 60 feet. And then that's gonna be resisted by a moment arm or a moment here generated by that reaction times a moment arm of 80 feet. Okay, and let me move this over a bit. So this is going to be, what is that, 260, uh, 25 times 40 is 1,000, and then 42 times 60 is 2520, and so... 260 plus 1,000 plus uh, 2520 is 3780. But kips uh, is going to be uh, equal to dy times 80 feet. And then therefore dy is positive. What was that 47.25 kips? which is 47.25 kips upwards, okay? Now, I went through that kind of quickly, but I've got to believe that you all are good with this, that we've done this enough times, that that's just old news at this point, okay? So before I move on, I'm going to you know, rely on chat here. Everybody good with this? Okay, now watch this. This is where things get kind of nuts, okay? 
Now let's do this problem again. Using using influence lines. Okay, so check this out. Um, let's uh, let's see if we can um, draw the influence line for the reaction at D. So the influence line for dy. Okay, so what do we know about the influence line for the reaction at D? Because keep in mind, I'm, I'm using dy because that's what we solved for up here. So what does the influence line for the reaction at D look like? Well, we know it's got to be zero here, and then it's got to be like one there, okay? So maybe the influence line looks like that. Would you agree with that? That should, that should be pretty simple, that the influence line uh, for the reaction at D looks like this. Well, it makes sense to me. Okay, good. All right, now, Let's let's do some some more with this though. Let's let's see if we can come up with some values. Can anybody look at the influence line and by observation tell me what these values are on the influence line? Like what are those values going to be? Uh 0 0.25, 0 0.5 and 0 0.75. There you go. Exactly right. 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. Exactly right. Okay. And then one other thing I want you to help me out with. Okay. I want to look at this distributed load. See how this distributed load occurs on that left portion of the beam? So that left portion of the beam, I want you to help me out. What is the area there? What is that area? So keep in mind. This distance here is 20 feet. So what is that area equal to? Five. It's not five. five and a, it's five halves because it's triangle. So 0.25 times 20 over 2. So the area is 2 pi. Don't forget, don't forget that. Okay. Now watch this. I propose then that because this influence line is for the reaction at D, then the reaction at D is computed as follows. What we do is we take each of these, let's do the concentrated loads first. So how many concentrated loads do we have on the beam? We have two. We have 25 and uh, we have 42. So what we do is, uh, actually, let me rewrite this because I, I don't want to squinch this up into a different lines. So dy equals 25 kips times something plus 42 kips times something. What we do here is we take each of these concentrated loads and we multiply by the associated value on the influence line, right? So the 25 kips, see how the 25 kips is associated with the 0 0.5? And see how the 42 is associated with the 0 0.75? And so that's how we would handle the distributed or the concentrated loads. As for the distributed loads, what we do is we take the distributed load and we multiply it times its associated area. And the area that it's associated with is this 2.5. And what do you get when you take 25 times 0.5, 42 times 0.75, and 1.3 kilo foot times 2.5, multiply them and add? What do you get?
You're an engineer, you don't have your calculator handy? My goodness. You get, oh, hold on. You get 47.25 kips. Same answer. I don't know about you, but that's a marker drop moment right there. Well, I'm not dropping this surface, and it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's expensive. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far, Mister Mister, <laughs> but um, that's basically you know uh, the deal here is that you can influence lines to directly perform the structural analysis. No need to rewrite you know or to write equations of equilibrium to some moments. All you have to do is just take the influence line values, multiply them by all concentrated loads and the influence areas and multiply them by all the distributed loads. Okay. So again, really, really straightforward process. Does anybody have any questions about that? It should be pretty straightforward. And again, we only use the, the shaded area for the distributed load because that's where it is. OK, if that 1.3 kips per foot was, say, over the whole beam, then we would use the whole area under the influence line. Everybody good? All right. So. For example, let, now let's see if we can reason through this. Uh, uh, some other ones. We we also have the um, the influence line for the moment at. Um, let's do the influence line. Uh, oh, I used the I wanted to use black for the base. We have the oh. I need to click away from it. That's what that's what's going on. I need the influence line for let's do the moment one just to just to make the point. OK, so let's see if we can reason our way through the influence line for the moment at B. OK, so what do we know about the influence line for the moment? At B? Well, we know that the influence line has to be zero here and it has to be zero there. Right. And it's got to be zero there because uh, that's the supports. Right. We're talking about internal moment. Internal response influence lines are always zero at the supports because if you put the load at the uh, supports, you don't get any response anywhere in the beam. Right. What do we do for an influence line for moment? We insert a hinge at B and we rotate it up a certain amount. So the shape should look something like this. That should be the shape, right? Now, here's the thing. Um, we want the total slope to be one, right? So whatever this slope is plus whatever this slope is, the total slope has to be one. But can you see that this is symmetric, right? We're drawing the influence line for the moment at B. And B is right in the middle of the beam. So I propose this has a slope of a half. This has a slope of a half. In other words, I could do the, you know, the H over L1 plus H over L2 is one. Uh, but they're going to be the same because this is H over 40 and this is H over 40. And so they're going to be one. So H over 40 has to be one half, right? And so H is 40 times one half or 20. So this value here is 20. Okay. If that's 20, in the interest of you know, moving through this, you know, somewhat expeditiously, that's going to make this 10 and it's going to make this value right here 10. Right, just following along with the 
you know, the pattern here. So therefore, the moment at B is going to equal, what is that, 25 kips times 20 plus 42 kips times 10 plus 1.3 kips per foot times whatever this area is here. What is that area? What is that area? Somebody help me out. It's 20 wide and it's 10 tall, so 20 times 10 divided by 2. Oh, I know y'all know that. There you go. I heard that. So that's 100. And so we have 25 times 20. So 25 times 20 plus 42 times 10 plus 1.3 times 100. And we get 1050. So MB is 1050. All right. Okay, now you're thinking to yourself, okay, that's fine. Now, how would I do that using the first method? Well, here's a simple way to do this doing, using the first method. Let me, let me scroll up a little bit. Well, actually, I'll leave it here for a second in case anybody's writing some stuff down, and then I'll, I'll sort of illustrate how you go about this using the first approach. Everybody good? Well, let me um, let me walk you through real quick how you would do this uh, using the previous approach, right? So we got this is 47.25 or 47.25 kips, right? And so if I sum forces in the y direction. I'm going to get AY is what? So I got 26 plus 25 plus 42 is 93. 93 minus 47.25 is 45.75 kips up. Right? That's this reaction. Maybe I'll, I'll rewrite this over here. I'll say AY is 45.75 kips. Right? And so let me just give you a real quick review on shear and moment diagrams, right? So hold on. That's close enough. Okay. So how would we draw the uh, the shear and moment diagram for for this beam? Well. We go up 45.75. This is our shear diagram, right? And then 45.75 minus 26 puts you at, what is that, 19.75, right? That's going to be a linear drop. No change. And then minus 25 puts you down to negative 5.25, no change, minus 42, puts you down to negative 47.25, brings you back up to zero, right? Maybe I'll draw this part a little better since that's supposed to be a, a diagonal line. Right. And so how do we draw the moment diagram? We need to get some areas. Right. And so maybe I'll start at the right, work my way over. So what is this? Negative 47.25 times 20. This is minus 945. Right. 
this area here, minus 5.25 times 20, minus 105, 19.75 times 20, positive 395. What about this area? So averaging 45.75 plus 19.75, times 20, I'm getting positive 655, right? Does the positive areas match the negative areas, right? So 655 plus 395 is 1050, and then minus 105 uh, minus 945 is negative 1050. And then when we draw our moment diagram, so what do we get when we draw our moment diagram? We, you know, here's, here's the moment diagram. Draw it in, in red. Right, so we start off at zero, right? And so we're gonna jump up to 655 lot to a little and then we're at 655 jump up 39 or 395 and what does that put us at puts us at 1050 straight line minus 105 brings us down to 945 i'll raise that up a bit straight line back down to zero. And so look what we get. Here's the moment diagram. What's the moment at B? 1050. What do we get for the moment at B? 1050. Different approach, right? Up here, you know, we drew the shear diagram, drew the moment diagram. Down here, we just use the influence line. Same answer. I'll scroll back up in case anybody wants to copy down the uh, uh, the moment diagrams. Just remember, linear, 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 parabolic. All right. I'm going to hold in here for a second, see if there's anybody that has any questions. All right, let me ask you a question. Um, and I'm asking chat here, okay? So let me. I would I would hope, I mean, and, and not only that, but it's, um, hold on, I, I made a mess here. Not only that, but it's more useful in scenarios uh, where loads move and that's going to become very very clear here in a bit this is going to become very clear um, because when loads move how do you determine worst case load placements and so on and so forth all right let me ask the chat a question okay based on the moment diagram the moment at b is 1050 so you know we're getting moment at B is 1050 foot kips. What is the shear at B? I'm, I'm making a point to, to ask the chat this because I want your opinion.
and if it if it helps your answer, this is kind of a trick question. It appears there are two shear values. That's because there are, and and you're exactly right. See, here's something I want to sort of introduce you to the idea to. Um, the internal shear at B changes at B. You could either say it's 19.75 or you could say it's negative 5.25. The difference is, you know, what side of, of, of the, the uh, or what side of the, the load at B are you considering? So if you're kind of session, you know, just to the, you know, just to the B, you might get a share of 19.75 or if you're cutting a section just to the right of B, it might be negative 5.25, but the point I want you to kind of get used to here is that there's a range. It's not one value, it's kind of a range. And, and I want to introduce you to that idea because that leads into our second direct application of, uh, of, of influence line, and that's maximum response. I'm going to skip this for now because I think at, what, at this point, what we're talking about here is sort of a philosophical difference as to whether or not it's 19.75 or negative 5.25. Instead, I want to kind of tackle that, that, that philosophical difference indirectly by talking about the second application. Let me go back to the slides here. Um, let's, let's, let's handle that a little differently. So... Okay, so our, so our first application was to do direct structural analysis, and we did direct structural analysis on this problem. And this was the problem we were just working on. And we got um, you know, the support reaction at D, we got the internal moment at D, but we kind of held off on that one because it seemed like we could get two different values, uh, and that's exactly right. Let's talk about those two different values by talking about our second application. That's looking at the worst case response. So let's go back to our original topic. Right? The original topic was moving loads. Okay. So what I mean by that is, you know, we have a, let's say we have a bridge and we have loads that are moving on that bridge. Um, I want to know where to put that load in order to generate the worst case scenario. Okay. Um, and I want to be able to use influence lines to assess that, okay? And we can use influence lines to place those loads. We can, uh, you know, place concentrated loads at the place of high, at the location of the highest value, and we can place distributed loads, you know, continuously across the structure to generate the worst case response. And so what I want you to think about is not so much, um, uh, not so much the the answer to an analysis, but the range of possibilities from an analysis. I, I kind of want you to start thinking about this in a little bit of a different term. Okay, so let's look at a, a, a perfect example. Okay, so let's look at an influence line and let's look at um, the influence line for shear. Okay, now I kind of have this influence line drawn here on the board. I didn't put dimensions on here because it doesn't really matter for the purposes of discussion, but maybe maybe these values, maybe I'll put um, this is minus a third and this is positive two thirds. Maybe that matters. Okay, so um, we're gonna determine, uh, we're gonna look at shear. Okay, so this is the influence line for the shear at section one one. Okay, whenever you look at this influence line, the influence line has both positive and negative values and areas. So we can generate a range of responses. So what I want to talk about is I want to talk about um, this value here. I want to talk about two kips per foot. And I want to ask, where would you put that load in order to generate the worst case response? Okay, so let me stop the share here for a second because I kind of want to look at this on the board. So let's say, and let's, let's try and paint this in, in a real world scenario. Okay, so this is a beam, uh, and let's say this beam represents a highway bridge, right? So, you know, you've got, you know, here's the, the, the canyon, here's the water, here's your height of your water, and here's the bridge, right? Okay, and here's the road, right? 
Right. So I've made a number of the civil professors happy. I put the road on here, so that'll make Dr. Bryce happy. And I put your little water symbol there, so that'll make Dr. Wade happy. Okay, so here's the bridge, okay? Um, now we've got our cars, you know, driving down the road. That's the best car you're going to get. But now, now I want you to think about this, this bridge as if it's having, you know, you know, this is one car, but this bridge could have loads of cars on it. I'll, I'll, the simplest way that we model uh, 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 traffic on a bridge is to just model it like it's just one big distributed load, right? Now, nothing says uh, that the, the traffic has to be, you know, in any one place. You know, if I'm looking at a bridge at any point in time, I might have traffic, you know, all over the bridge, right? There might be traffic everywhere, right? Maybe it's... Uh, there, there's a concert and everybody's backed up to try and go to the concert. So maybe the whole bridge is seeing load. Maybe only some of the bridge is seeing load. Maybe only the traffic is, you know, on this portion. So this distributed load can really be anywhere. It can be just here. It can be across the whole bridge. It can be in just this spot. You could put that distributed load anywhere on the bridge. And so as an analyst and ultimately as a designer, what I want to know is where is the worst place to place that load in order to generate the worst response? And so what I do is I do that by focusing one section at a time. So let's look at section 1-1, okay? This is the influence line for shear at section 1-1. So where do I place that load in order to generate the worst case response? I figure that out by looking at the influence line, okay? The influence line has negative regions and it has positive regions. I propose that there's really going to be two load cases to consider. So I'll sort of draw two beams. Let's say we have a beam here and a beam here. So it's the same beam. I'm just drawing two different pictures. Okay. So, again, the question to ask is where to put two kips per foot. So this is my load. Where do I put that load to generate the worst case response? Again. I follow the influence line. Where do I generate the worst case possible positive shear? It's where the load acts right here. Why there? Because that's everywhere on the influence line that we generate a positive response. What about negative response? I place the load right here anywhere that the beam sees a negative shear at this location. So let me go to the slide here. So here's my beam. Where do I place that load to generate the worst case response? The worst case load placement for some positive response is right here. Okay, now let's take this load case. How would I determine the shear for this beam? And keep in mind, our point of interest is always right there. That's the point that we're trying to maximize. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I take two kips per foot, and what do I multiply it by? I multiply it by the area under the shear diagram. Okay, and so how do I get that? Base times height over two. So I take the, the influence line area times that load, and when you plug and chug for this particular problem, you get a shear of positive 26.67 kips, okay? What about for maximum negative response? So I place the load everywhere that I get a negative uh, uh, value on my influence line, which is on the other part of the beam. And so this would give me a shear of negative 13.33 kips. I don't want you to think, of, when you're talking about moving loads, I don't want you to think about, you know, what's the answer. It's more about what's the range of answers. I propose that if we're looking at this point on the beam and we're focusing on two kips per foot, that that point on the beam experiences a range anywhere between a positive shear of 26.67 to a negative shear of negative 13.3. That 26.67 is the largest possible positive shear we can get at that point. And the negative 13.3 is, I guess, the largest negative shear that you can get at that point. 
you cannot generate a positive shear larger than 26.67 kips, and you can't generate a negative shear larger than negative 13.33. I know I'm using the term larger with negatives, but we're talking about magnitudes here. That is the worst case range for, again, for that load. If I were to change that load from two kips per foot to three kips per foot, I'd get a different range. But that's the point is that that particular point on the beam can experience that range of shears. And so what you would do as a bridge engineer is you would just pick a number of points on the beam and determine a range for each of those points. And we call that an envelope. So that, that's what I mean by the, by the term envelope. Now, uh, I want to introduce some terminology that I'm going to use here in a bit. Uh, and, and you're going to see this terminology a fair amount in uh, structural engineering practice and in design courses. So like steel design, concrete design, we'll use this terminology quite a bit. Um, whenever you're looking at structures, some loads are stationary and some aren't. Um, some loads always sit there and some loads move. So for instance, one of the most common loads that is always present is the beam's self weight, right? So if I have this beam and this beam weighs like 100 pounds per foot, that 100 pounds per foot acts everywhere on the beam. That doesn't go, anywhere, okay? So um, we, we have a terminology that we use called dead loads and live loads. So dead loads typically refer to permanent loads that remain stationary, that, that don't move. Um, and live loads uh, refer to loads that, that, that do move. So you might hear the words permanent and transient. So permanent loads remain stationary, transient loads move. So an example of a dead load would be like the structure self-weight. That's going to basically be everywhere. A live load would be like the traffic on the bridge. And you put that traffic wherever you need to put it to generate the worst case response. So dead loads would be applied everywhere. Live loads could be applied anywhere. That's that's really sort of the, the, the best way to look at it. And it does lead to a differentiation. Dead loads generate a single response. Live loads generate a range of responses, okay? And the easiest way to sort of wrap your head around that is to look at an example. So we did this example a while back. We, we looked at this particular structure. We drew influence lines for it. So we've already drawn the influence lines for this section, okay? So we're gonna determine the worst case shears and moments due to a series of loads. And, and I, I made up these loads, so they're, they're nothing uh, uh, really to write home about. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the specific loads you use in ASHTO. But we're gonna use a dead load of 1.2 kips per foot. We're gonna use a live load of 1.6 kips per foot. We're gonna use a concentrated load of 25 kips. And I think you're gonna find that this is a lot easier than it seems. But what I wanna do is I wanna generate the worst case response. So if that beam has, so let's say this is a concrete beam and it weighs like 1,200 pounds per foot, 1.2 kips per foot. I wanna know the shear and moment at that section. I also wanna know if I have a 1.6 kip per foot distributed load and a 25 per foot live load, what is the worst case response I could get at that section. So let's see if we can tackle that problem. And I think you're going to find it's uh, it's pretty doable. So let's um, let's go back to the notebook. All right. So let's go to that problem. So here's our here's our beam. And again, we already drew the. Um, the, the influence lines for this beam before. Let's let us let us do shear. I think probably because of time, we're only gonna have time to do shear, but you'll see how it really, really doesn't matter. Um, the first thing I wanna do is I want to look at uh, some areas, okay? So let's take these areas one at a time. So we've got one, two, I guess like three, four areas if, if we wanna look at it like that. So let's start from the left and work our way over. So what's the area here? Okay, so we have one half of 12, uh, one half of 12 times 0.4. Um, I'm getting 5.76. That's the area of this like triangular region right here. And in chat, if, if I, I'm just roughing this out, if I get a value that's wrong, let me know. Okay, so this is, uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, that is wrong because I didn't I didn't do a divide there. Yep, that's wrong. That's, that's 2.4, sorry. 
sorry, that's 2.4. Okay, this next one, uh, one half um, times 0.4 times, oh, I'm getting a 1.6 right here. Trying to make that a little more doable. I'll just leave the shading there. That area is 1.6. What about this area? This is, um, what do we got? We've got 0.5 times 0.7 times 14. And so that's a negative 4.9. And somebody help me out. I want to make sure everybody's paying attention. What are we getting for the last one? What's the area right here? Point 0.9, so point 0.5 times point 0.3 times 6. Yeah, 0 0.9. Okay, and the, the important thing to recognize is that, you know, the first two regions, the last regions are positive, that last region is negative. Okay, so let's, let's write down the loads that we had. We had a dead load, of 1.2 kips per foot we had a live load of 1.6 kips per foot and this uh, and this is distributed and we had a live load of 25 kips and this was concentrated so Let's take each of these one at a time, okay? So let's talk about the uh, the live loads first, because I think I want to relate that to the discussion. If I wanted to generate, and let's let's put some labels here, okay? So this is point A, this is point B, this is point C, this is the section, and we'll call this the hinge. If I wanted to generate the worst case positive shear at section 1 1 where would i place this 25 kip load we're talking about the 25 kip load where do i put that load to generate the worst case positive shear i'm asking chat here the hinge because that has the worst case positive value where do i generate the worst case negative shear where do i put it You put it at one. They put it at section one, like just to the just to the left of that section. That's exactly right. Okay, and so that's where you would put the live load, the concentrated live load. For the distributed load, if you wanted to generate worst case positive shear, you'd put the load everywhere there's positive area uh, between A and B, and between the section at C. If you wanted to generate the worst case negative shear, where would you put it? Between B and the section, right? And so here's how, how you go about this. Um, how do we generate, so we'll say shear at section 1-1, one, one. what's the worst case positive answer? Well, how do we do this? We say 1 point, sorry, 1 1.6 kips per foot times, times all the positive areas, so 2.4 plus 1.6 plus 0 0.9 plus 25 kips times, where did we say, where did Mr. Y say? He said put it at the hinge, 0 0.4. Now, the only thing that's left is the dead load. Where do we put the dead load? We don't have an option where to put the dead load. The dead load goes everywhere. That's the weight of the beam. Like it, it doesn't go anywhere. So we have to put it 2.4 plus 1.6 minus 4.9 plus 0 0.9. We put it everywhere. Okay. And so that's how we would handle the worst case positive shear at section 1-1. How do we handle the worst case 
negative shear at 1, 1, something similar. So, you know, it doesn't matter what order you go in, you still take the 1.2 kips per foot and put it everywhere. And for the other loads, again, where it generates negative response, negative 4.9, because that's the only place that has negative area, plus 25 kips, negative 0 0.7, okay? And so whatever values you get for this and this, that's the range of shears that that section would expect. Again, the dead load goes everywhere, a live load you only place to generate the worst case response. And so a test of your understanding might be, okay, do the same thing for the moment uh, uh, influence line. You know, think where would you put a, 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 a distributed load? Well, the distributed load to generate positive moment would go between B and C. To generate negative moment, it would go between A and B. I think where do you put the concentrated loads for positive moment put it at the section for negative moment put it at the hinge right and for the distributed load the distributed load goes everywhere and how do we do that that structural analysis same way we did it in the last example it's concentrated loads times values distributed loads times areas and that's influence lines that's basically it does anybody have any questions on this I know we're we're like one minute over. Can RISA factor in den loads based on cross-sectional area and material of the beam? It can, um, and it actually already had also has library of moving load patterns. I'll be honest, I can't like I don't cover that in here, not because it's not valuable, but because you know that would be something we'd probably handle either in a structures two class or, or something like that, simply because time. But it can do that. In fact, when you uh, use a rolled shape, for instance, like a W18 by 35, the 35 tells you how heavy it is. It's 35 pounds a foot. So it, that, that knowledge is already built in. So it can handle that. And there's also other software packages that are specifically geared to generate moment and shear envelopes for bridges. Um, RISA can do it, but there are some, some programs that can do it better. And it's not because RISA is bad. It's just those programs are geared to also do the design calcs. So, but that that's, you know, discussions for another day. Any other quick questions before we call it? Yeah, Dr. Michelson, for the dead loads, um, for the positive one, you added um, oh, all the areas. Right. That's, that's subtracted that the 4.9? Okay. That so needs to be negative. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's supposed to be okay. negative. And then those yeah. all cancel out to zero, correct? Do they? I think they do. I think it adds to be 4.9 minus 4.9. I think you're right, yes. Is, uh, it, is that, it always going to be like that, or is that no. just a... No, no, that, that's a, a sheer happenstance on this problem. Because here, here's the way to say that. Uh, go back to, and I, I know we're running out of time, but I, I think this is valuable. Go back to... Um, uh, go back to this. That won't happen here, right? That won't yeah. happen here because this area is bigger than that area. So, th so that won't happen. If you think about it like this. If I were to just put dead load everywhere on this beam and draw the shear diagram, I wouldn't get shear equals zero right there. That, that won't happen. It would if it was at mid-span, because if you draw the shear diagram for a distributed load, it sort of goes like that, and you do get shear, uh, shear equals zero, but that's at mid-span. Makes sense. Thank that's you. A that's a great question. Yes. All right. I know we're running out of time. I got to go ahead and call it. Um, I will see you all on Wednesday. We'll sort of pick up on this discussion and talk about some Ashto load models so that you can see some, some more real life aspects of how this stuff is done. I will see you all on Wednesday.